Hello and welcome to another Top Grades Made Easy video. We're diving into description here and I'm going to show you a piece of writing which is 478 words long, something you could write in the exam in 45 minutes, basically 10 words per minute. You will notice from my colour coding that the metaphors are in yellow and the similes are in green. Let's scroll down to see quite how many I've managed to pack in. 31 metaphors compared to 11 similes. If you master these two techniques, you can't fail to get top grades. As you can see, there are nearly three times as many metaphors as there are similes. That is because metaphors are the kings of writing, if we're going to be old-fashioned about this, and the similes are the queens. And the reason for that is simple. When the brain meets a metaphor, it has to do a little bit more work to see how the comparison functions compared to the simile where the comparison is a little bit more obvious. Right, well, the next thing I want you to focus on is how I've constructed this. I've just walked around with my camera phone taking almost random shots and then putting them together without a particular order. And for each shot, I've written a metaphor or a simile, pretty much. And that has constructed my piece of writing. This is a fantastic way to revise because it forces you to think in pictures. It forces you to write in metaphors and similes. And of course, you will never turn it into a story by mistake. It will always be a true description. Thinking in pictures in this way also helps me to nail the punctuation and sentence structure marks, those 16 marks out of 40. So you'll notice when I start to link pictures together, I can use semicolons to do that. And I use a colon to introduce the explanation. Here, the decks of fishing boats explode with clutter and then the semicolon sentences that follow it explain what the clutter is. Now suddenly I have one of these big show-off sentences which is going to make the examiner excited. I've highlighted that to count the number of words. It's 43 words long. Now your examiner is not going to read any other correctly punctuated sentences that are longer or better than that. It'll just zap them between the eyes and they already want to give you a top grade. If I scroll up, you'll see that this is my second paragraph. And tactically, why do I do that? Well, first impressions count. And getting the first impression in the examiner's mind, look, give me a grade nine. I've got this brilliant kind of way of describing with these fantastically detailed sentences perfectly controlled with the right punctuation and they start your writing with a grade nine in their mind. Now, if the rest of your writing isn't as successful, they're counting back from a grade nine. It's almost impossible for you to end up with a grade six, having started with a grade nine in the examiner's head. And that's why you stick your show off sentences in first. Now, there are two aspects of sound that I also want to draw your attention to. And they're both types of alliteration. With my C sounds here, clanking like a convict's chains, you'll see the use of Cs and Ks to mimic the sound of metal and motors. So you use the alliteration of these harsh sounds to recreate in an onomatopoeic way the harsh sounds that are in your description. Because I have a seaside setting, I also want the soft sound of the sea. Well, again, I'm going to use alliteration, but this time the repetition of the S sound to create that sound of the sea has a name. It's called sibilance. And so you'll see the sea's soft susurration. That's a brilliant word to learn, by the way. Look it up. It means the sound of whispers. Scandinavian mothers careless of the cold, spinning like seals in the soft cradle of the waves. Again, you can hear the sibilance recreating the sound of the waves gently lapping at the shore. Here, the harsh alliteration of the seas in careless, cold and cradle 
kind of recreates that shivering, hostile reaction to the cold. It certainly emphasises the cold, doesn't it? Which is what this particular passage is about. Next, I'm going to introduce you to the idea of the extended metaphor, focusing on these beach huts. So there's a line of them here. And then as I scroll through, you'll see there's another line behind and another line further up the hill. They're in ranks. And so from this, I've tried to construct a metaphor that runs all the way through my paragraph. The shore is lined with beach huts. What's that like? Well, I didn't go for the military idea, which was the obvious one. I went for rows of identikit commuters lining up for a train, so they're on a crowded platform. Each one has a balcony in front of it, and so I decided the balcony with its railings are like an open laptop, as though they're getting ready to work on the train. Then I've got a jogger that comes by, and so instead of just running by, he's going to chug noisily down their track, because he's going to be like a train in this extended metaphor. Now I imagine the passengers waiting to get on are female here because they're going to paint their faces. I needed that because all the beach huts are painted in different shades. And so I had to make that human in some way. I also realised that this painting of their faces we could decide was vanity. And so I've given them blank stares which are only interested in appearance, which gave me the idea of having them frozen as though they'd been Botoxed. Again, that links to the idea of vanity. So I've managed to keep the idea of commuters on a platform waiting to get on a train all the way through this description of beach huts. Another top grade technique is to use literary allusions. So I've decided that this guy coming down in his wetsuit, his neoprene, is like barefooted Achilles, whose mother was a goddess of the sea. Now, I'm not expecting you to know that, okay? But it works for me, because obviously I know the story, and I'm banking on some of the examiners knowing it. It doesn't actually matter if they don't. You can pick literary allusions about texts that you know. You know, for example, your Shakespeare play. I do that towards the end, where we're going to see a bench with two bouquets of flowers, which reminded me of those flaming torches that Shakespeare would have used in his plays. Why? Because the plays were performed in daylight, so to tell the audience, hey guys, it's night time now, you'd come on with flaming torches and say, look, we need torches to see by, it's night. Now I've continued, in an extended metaphor, the idea of the play, by calling two dogs and a council litter picker the audience. They are the cheaper audience who only pay a penny, which in Shakespeare's time were called groundlings, because they had to sit or stand on the ground. They didn't get seats. And then I've carried that literary illusion on with my seagull that decides to flap off and fly away, because I've decided that the seagull is therefore like an offended critic, a critic is someone who's paid to go and watch the plays and review them for newspapers. So obviously this Shakespeare play was no good. And that gets me back to why the benches were empty. They're looking at a play that's no good at all. It's not entertaining. Just like a seaside in the autumn is no fun. I'm just trying to show you how I'm trying to think in a literary way. When I do that, referencing books that the examiners will know, I automatically connect with them on a deeper level and on a more intellectual level. I'm having a conversation with this English teacher, because examiners are English teachers, in a language they understand, and so they will appreciate it. Some joker has spun the street signs in a Russian roulette, so the town centre languishes on the beach. A family circle their dog, hoping to be guided, but she's saying nothing. Unlike the yellow-coated cockle-catcher boasting next to his steaming sacks, he is mimicked by a life-sized custard-coated fisherman posed with a wooden fish. Ragged flags tear at the wind. The dock comes alive with metal clanking like a convict's chains. 
The decks of fishing boats explode with clutter, tangled nets like discarded hair extensions after a night out at sea. Snakes of rubber rope sleep on the quay, chains and rope lie in a coiled embrace, a parody of lovers or modern art. Boats are docked in pairs, secretly holding hands. The single boats, painted in a blushing red, hug the harbour walls like shy teenagers at the school prom. Local traders have converted beach huts, flickering with neon invitations to buy. Tourists, in their torn jeans, traipse on past the desperate coffee stalls and oyster bars. Their camper vans are washed up everywhere like flotsam. Their dogs survey their dominions from front seat thrones that come and get me look in their eyes. With the face of a giant toad, a buggy sits on the sand among sailing boats flocked on the shore. Smaller boats lie exhausted, caught on the shingle. Families stand at the water's edge, dreaming of escape. A flutter of birds bathe in a puddle, sending ripples to the sky. Pebbles carpet the beach like spat-out gum. Gobs of seaweed, like last night's spaghetti. Ranks of groins guard against the sea's thievery. The middle-aged meditate on stones and the sea's soft susurration. Down the hill strides a lone warrior in silhouette, an extra skin of neoprene, armour plating against the cold. Like barefooted Achilles, he strides towards the sea, only to find Scandinavian mothers, careless of the cold, spinning like seals in the soft cradle of the waves. The shore is lined with beach huts, rows of identikit commuters crowding a platform, each clutching a balcony like an open laptop. A jogger chugs noisily down their track. They paint their faces in pastel shades before boarding, but their faces still look blank, frozen in Botox. A garbage truck offers its best tortoise impression while cyclists yearn to glide by. The ice cream shops still advertise summer. Their facades are false promises, shuttered windows, locked doors. Even the kites are flying at half-mast. One has died in the long grass. Empty benches watch the horizon, one with two bouquets strapped to its sides, like flaming torches in a Shakespeare play. Two dogs and a council litter picker are the only groundlings, more interested in each other. A lone seagull storms off like an offended critic. A beacon stands against the wind, wearing an empty crown. It too has lost its fire. And congratulations if you've made it this far. If you want to get even better, why not check out the videos appearing in the top left and the top right. Thank you so much for sticking with my channel. See you soon.